Our reading for this morning's lesson comes from Hebrews, the 13th chapter. Hebrews 13, starting at verse 1. Let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember them that are in bonds, as bonds with them, and with the, and them which suffer adversity, as being yourselves also in the body. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he saith, for he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear that fear what men shall do unto me. You will mark five twenty nine. Wish you all a good Lord's Day. Happy to have your presence this morning. Title of this lesson is called Let Brotherly Love Continue. As based on our reading that Larry gave us just a few moments ago. It is always a good time to consider hospitality. Are we truly a welcoming group? We talk about brotherly love, but do we know what it is? Do we practice it? And we should be practicing what the Lord has taught us because he has not changed. And we do see some of these lessons in Hebrews, the 13th chapter. Beginning in the reading in Hebrews 13, turn with me there to verse 1. It reads, let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember them that are in bonds as bound with them, and them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. Verse 1, it talks about the love that people extend to others by the common relationships that we have in the family of God. And we should observe those things and let them continue throughout our lives. Verse 2, it talks about, you know, as in Genesis 18, not to forget to entertain strangers because sometimes you might be entertaining someone a lot higher in stature than you realize, such as an angel. And in verse 3, it says not to forget the Christians who are in chains, who are in persecutions, because we need to look at ourselves and consider ourselves as partakers of that persecution as well, because we could be there also. We need to be united as Christians. We need to be united, rejoicing and mourning when we rejoice and we mourn. Matthew 7, verse 7, it reads, Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you, whom if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? If he ask a fish, will he give a serpent? Or if then you then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? Therefore all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. And as in 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 through 31, we need to be one. And to have brotherly love, to be united. In verse 12, for as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are in are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, 
whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them in the body, as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body, which seem to be more feeble, are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness, for our comely parts have no need. But God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked, for that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and members in particular. And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers. After that, miracles and gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Have all the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret, but covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way? So we have to realize that to be united is to indicate that there is a reason to be united. Could you imagine if one foot wanted to go this way and one foot wanted to go the other? What would you do? You'd either be doing the splits or you'd be falling on your face. That wouldn't work out real well, would it? You know. And what part of the body do you want to sacrifice? If I said, okay, Jeff, I'm going to, you, well, he's, he's got his eye. He's, uh, maybe he's practiced sacrificing today. But you know what? If you've met someone who's lost a body part, and you'll say, do you miss that body part? They'll say yes. I have a grandfather who had the tip of his right index finger gone. And he had been gone for years and years and years. And you say, Grandpa, did you ever try to use that part of your finger? And he said, of course. 50, 60 years later, he still missed that body part, even though we would think the tip of our finger wouldn't be that big a deal. But it's definitely a big deal. And we need to be united together because everybody is important in the church of the Lord. Hebrews 13, verse 4 through 6, it talks about the need to not covet, not to desire that you have no right to have. Verse 4, it says, marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Let your conversation or your conduct be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. In verse 6, it, it talks about, you know, God is our helper. But we often forget to put things in God's hands. You know what? God gives us free will, and he says, Okay, go ahead and do it yourself if you want to. But God can help us do anything. And we have to remember those things. And if we put it in our own hands, it doesn't always have good effect. You know, in Genesis 16, what does Sarah do with Hagar, her handmaid? She gives her to Abraham to sire a child. And having a son, instead of trusting in what was promised to them, that they would have a son. You know, it says, and the Lord said to Abram in Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house into a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. 
and Lot went with him, and Abram was 70 and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And God took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother, son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. See, Abraham, at that time, Abram had been promised blessings through his seed. But they decided to help God along. And it wasn't the way God wanted. Ishmael came and he was a wild man and he was not the one that was to have this blessing. But God will bless us. You know, the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 and seeing the multitudes, Jesus goes up into a mountain. He went up into a mountain and when he was set, his disciples came to him and he opened his mouth and taught them saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Jesus is reminding us that we have great blessings. But even if we're persecuted for righteousness sake we shouldn't sit there and say what have I done wrong. You do, and you continue the things which you do. If what you're teaching is righteous, you have God's pleasure. We have to remind ourselves of these things. Now, you know, having said that, if I'm preaching something that is incorrect, you are not my enemy if you point it out to me. You are my friend. The reason we get up here and preach, believe me, it's easier to sit in a comfy pew and to listen and smile, sing some songs, say amen to the prayer and go home. But to get up here, you put yourself in the firing line because you're a public face of what the Lord has. But we are to be these things because we want to tell the world what these things are. We want everybody to go to heaven, even those who don't like us. Even those that don't like the way we say things or the fashion of the way we say it. You know, but we can't do anything but do what is righteous. And that is what the Lord will judge. You know, Hebrews 13 and verse 7, it reads, Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever, be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. We are to remember the elders who have the rule over the local church. Why do we want to remember those who have the rule over us? Because God asks us, he desires us, and he expects us to respect our leaders. That includes the secular leaders. You know, Romans 13, 1 through 7, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore he must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For for this cause... Pay you tribute also, for they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, 
Fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. You may not like the governor. You may not like your mayor. You may not like the city council or the town council. You may not like the clerk treasurer. You may not like the president or whomever is in office. But you know what? As long as they are in power, God expects us to obey them. I'm not saying that if the, if the president declares that you shall kill your firstborn child that you do it. We're not obligated to sin. But we are obligated to do those things peacefully. To do the things that the Lord wants us to do because he's put that person in there. A lot of people are up in arms about the election going on soon. And you know what? It is always a tumultuous time and it's amazing how people on both sides get themselves into a lather. But you know what? Eventually, the current president's term will expire. Whether he is reelected to take another four years or if someone else is elected to take his place, that is whom God has appointed. We think we have free will. The Lord will say who it will be. We need to remember that and to obey them. But we also need to obey our spiritual rulers. First Peter five one through seven. The elders which I which among you I exhort, which are among you I exhort, whom also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint. But willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Likewise, you younger, submit yourselves to the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Verse 8, it says, Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. Malachi 3, 1 through 6, it talks about that. Verse 6, it says specifically, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. And in verse 8, it's a warning against diverse and strange doctrines. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 9, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and leave captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and ever able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, as, Jambres, as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith, but they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. You know, people love their own selves. And it's very easy to get into that mindset when you have a place that is supposedly of great stature. People are saying, well, you just love hearing your own voice. You know what, I've heard pe people have told me that for 40 years. You just love the sound of your voice. And I'll tell you something, there is nothing I hate to hear more than a recording of my voice. I hate it. I think I have the worst voice on earth. And people say, you have a great voice. I don't believe you. <laughs> I don't. I wish I was lying. I, I don't like my voice. It just doesn't sound right. And I think the way to get through life is to be your harshest critic. There is never a lesson I give that I'm happy with. It must be better. It must be tighter. It must be more full of scripture. Sometimes I think maybe it should have a couple less. I put my audience to sleep. 
you know, maybe I should be more exciting. Maybe I should be less exciting. Maybe I should use PowerPoint, but I don't like PowerPoint because I can't, I can't boogie off the script. <laughs> you know what? Never be satisfied with what you are as a Christian. Because if we aren't going forward, we are going backwards. We are drifting, brethren, if all we do is the same thing. Are we paying attention to what we need to teach? Are we paying attention to whom needs to hear it? Are we doing everything we can to get people here? Because there's only one way. It's the Lord's way. Ephesians 4, 1 through 7, Paul writes by inspiration, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, forbear endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Continuing in Hebrews 13, verses 10 through 16, we have an altar whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But to do good and to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. You know? Like the bones of sacrificed animals outside the Israelites camp. Jesus was sacrificed outside Jerusalem. We also need to be willing to serve Jesus, to bear his reproach. We seek the city of God, the new Jerusalem in heaven. Revelation 21, 1 through 4, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Why do we praise God? Why do we worship God singing, sacrificing for the Lord? Why do we do these things? Because it pleases God. You know, in verses 15 through 16, it says this, for such sacrifices, God is well pleased. You know what? I wish all people liked me. Don't you? Don't you? I don't like... I, I don't want to go through a life where people don't, don't like me. But you know what? People are people and they act accordingly. I have no doubt there are people out there that hate my existence and would love nothing more than to read my obituary in the paper. And you know what? I'd like you to agree with me on everything. But it doesn't really matter if you agree with me. It doesn't really matter if I agree with me. Well, I better be following what I think is right and doing what is right. But it's better if I follow what the Lord wants me to follow. Amen. If we are not following what God wants us to do, but we are pleasing men, we'll be going arm in arm into hell because we want to please everybody. If we want to please people, being a Christian is not the way to go. If Jesus is so pleasing, why do we re bear in remembrance his death by being executed on a cross by people who claim that they were serving God? There are people who think to get rid of some people does service to God. It doesn't. It causes discord. It causes 
all kinds of things. It discourages the faithful and it leaves those who are not faithful to say, look at them. Who wants to be a part of a group like that? Again, we need to please God and nobody else. Hebrews 13, verses 17 through 25, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Pray for us, for we trust we have a good conscience and all things willing to live honestly. But I beseech you the rather to do this, that I may be restored to you the sooner. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And I beseech you, brethren, suffer the word of exhortation, for I have written a letter unto you in few words. Know ye that our brother Timothy is set at liberty, with whom if he comes shortly I will see you. Salute all them that have the rule over you and all the saints. They of Italy salute you. Grace be with you all. Amen. Verse 17 tells us to obey the elders or rulers. And why? They need to be obeyed so that we can prosper. God ordains that we have leadership. We need to do it so we can prosper. You know, what is the qualification to be an elder? Well, 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 13, this is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. Then let those also first be proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children in their own houses well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well, purchased themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Also in Titus 1, 5 through 10 it says, For this cause left I thee in Crete, when thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain, or appoint elders in every city as I had appointed thee. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children not accused of riot or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. Why do we have qualifications? It's so that they will do the job correctly, that they will do the job righteously. It's because God wants it that way. Verses 18 through 19, you know, it's good to pray for those laboring in the Lord's work. In Hebrew, you know, talk about back to Hebrew, so they can see the Hebrews that this letter is addressed to. And verses 20 through 25 ends the letter. Now what? Why well, discuss the last chapter of Hebrews? For those of you wondering how timely this lesson is, the date that I prepared this lesson and put it in the file was March 31st, 2020 recent events that some people know about and some will eventually know about you know what i wrote this before that hospitality we need to remember brotherly love and that is a good lesson in march but let's face it every, every month every day every year is a time 
to follow brotherly love. So to summarize the lesson, we need to follow brotherly love, as stated, to be hospitable and remember those who are imprisoned. It is a reminder that marriage is better than that of following the way of the adulterer or the whoremonger. Don't covet either. Be content with what God has given us because the Lord is our helper. And don't forget those who rule over us. And remember that God, the Father, and His Son, and the Holy Ghost, they're all unchanging. To avoid untrue or new doctrines. Be mindful of how Jesus is the sacrifice for us. And we are to sacrifice ourselves also as it pleases God. To praise God. And there is much to come. And don't forget to pray. In other words, do those things that serve God. Those things that help us go to heaven. Have you heard the word as in Romans 10 and 17? If you've heard the word, do you believe it? You know, Mark 16, 16. He who believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned to repent. Okay, I've heard the word and I believe it. Am I going to change my ways? You know, if you're a thief, you don't steal anymore. If you're a liar, you don't lie anymore. If you're a deceiver, you don't deceive. If you're an adulterer, you don't adulterate. Okay, maybe that's not quite the word. Then you confess, as in Acts 8, the Ethiopian eunuch said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. To be baptized, as we read in Mark 16, 16, to be live faithfully unto death, as in Revelation 2 and verse 10. One last word, one last phrase, and the lesson is yours. Let brotherly love continue. That's our lesson. The invitation of, we have a song of invitation prepared for us. The invitation applies in any fashion. You need to be a Christian, we can baptize you this day. If you've fallen short, and you need the prayers of the congregation, you need to make confession of sin, you can do that as well. The invitation applies to you in any fashion. Please come forward, make your wants known while we stand and sing.